welcome to the latest episode of the Jaguar Maven podcast. This is our first episode in a few weeks, you know, due to the busy holiday season and some family obligations. But we are back in the studio to deliver you the hottest, most correct Jaguars takes anywhere, online, offline, anywhere at all. This is the Jaguar Maven podcast. I'm uh, John Shipley, publisher of Jaguar Maven. We've been turning out a lot of content since the season ended. And this is just another part of that. And joining me is uh, Treeb. Treeb, say what's up to the folks. What's going on, guys? And of course... Everything John said was 100% accurate. You know, you don't got to go anywhere else for more correct Jaguar takes. Everything we got here is 100% right, 100% cited. And you're listening to the best Jaguar podcast on the net. Sorry it's been so long, but, you know, we back in this business. And I know you all missed us, but we're in the studio, so we're back. We're doing it. Yep, yep. Hey, hey you know what? Uh, it's it's our off season too. <laughs> I mean, life yeah, life yeah, happens. So, but we we are back in the swing of things. We we actually got a really busy uh, off season planned ahead for Jaguar Maven. Our man Andrew Dieco is uh, at the East West Shrine Bowl. I'm going to be at the Senior Bowl in Mobile in about a week or so, and we are planning to be at the NFL Combine in Annapolis later this off season. So we're going to have a lot of different things cooking up for you guys. You know, just because the season's over. And there's no games or practices or anything at the stadium. That doesn't mean our work's over. So, you know, this this is kind of, you know, one piece of that. And there, there's been quite a few things, Tree, that have kind of, you know, taken place since the last time we recorded. Uh, yeah. Obviously, the big one is uh, about two weeks ago. I think it was exactly today. So about 14 days ago, uh, Jaguars owner Shad Khan announced that he would be retaining Doug Marone as head coach and Dave Caldwell in 2020. Uh, of course, Marone has been the Jaguars head coach since 2017, and Caldwell has been in his role since 2013, even though he was kind of neutered in 2017 for the last three years. So while he still was GM, he wasn't exactly like the overbearing voice in the front office room like he was for his you know first four years with the Jaguars. But that was the big news with the Jaguars this offseason. A lot of people expected them to make a change, at least with the head coach. Uh, ESPN, Diana Rossini even reported that Jaguars would make a change at head coach, but ended up a day after Black Monday. Uh, it was actually pretty early in the morning on Tuesday. So just a little bit after Black Monday, uh, Khan met with Marone. He met with Caldwell and he announced that, hey, they would be coming back. So, I mean, Treve, just, just to start us off on today's episode, w- were you surprised uh, when you heard that uh, Marone and Caldwell will be back? Like, just give me your initial reaction, really. I really wasn't, um, which is funny because in the last podcast, I think we kind of had this discussion because it was the week 17 game and we talked about, you know, what do you think the Jags are going to do come Black Monday? And I don't have a problem necessarily with Doug Marone sticking around. I think he's a player's coach. I think, you know, the guys out there that are playing want to play for him. And I think it's mostly, you know, it was a Tom Coughlin issue. And, you know, he's out the building. I, I like Doug Marone sticking around. I know that that sounds Shad Khan-y because, you know, everybody's talking about how Shad Khan, you know, he's he's kind of given all these guys a lot of chances and he has a lot yeah. of patience. I, I, and, and I, think, I, I think most people's issues is they see it as him looking complacent. Would you agree with that? Yeah, 100%. And that's why I really wasn't that surprised by it because, you know, I was shocked he even fired Tom Coughlin, to be 100% yeah. honest. Yeah. And, I mean, that kind of felt like it was forced by the NFLPA, too. Yeah, because, I mean, if they didn't leak all that information – well, not necessarily leak, but, you know, like, reveal all that information. Yeah, they didn't drop a complete hammer on top of Coughlin's head. (laughs) Yeah, if they didn't – yeah, if they didn't completely, like, show all the issues that were, you know, with Tom Coughlin, he probably would have stuck around. But, you know, I I think it comes down to, you know, how Shad Khan is – as an owner, you know, he hired Dave Caldwell, yeah. he hired Doug Marone, and even it popped up in my memories. I think it was two, three days ago is the th- three year anniversary of when the Jags officially made the announcement that they were hiring Doug Marone yeah. as their head coach. And, you know, even that kind of shows some sort of complacency with Shad Khan because, you know, he didn't go out of his way to sign a guy from another program or sign another guy from another team. He decided to hire inside of the organization even though at the time, you know, it's a struggling organization. It always has been, you know, Marone has had that 2017 year, but the talent on the field was, you know, undeniable at that point. I think Doug Marone is a guy that deserves an opportunity and deserves some better coordinators. You know, we'll get into the, the flip stuff here in a little bit, but you know, with like, I'm surprised, you know, Todd Wash is still there. I don't know. Like, 
how much longer that's going to last or if that's actually going to be, you know, an all next season thing. He's going to be there. Yeah. But I, I was kind of shocked about the Dave Caldwell, but you kind of got the feeling that if Doug Marone was going to stay, then Dave Caldwell was going to stay. And, and you see the main argument is, you know, Caldwell, you know, he had Tom Coughlin breathing down his neck for, you know, a majority of his run. And, you know, they're like, well, let's see what Caldwell can do with given the mm-hmm. cards to draft a team. And then you look at, like, his 2013 draft class. It was abysmal. And it just, you know, I'm Yeah, hoping- I mean, looking at Caldwell's track record, you know, before Coughlin came in, it, it's so con- hard to talk about Coughlin's, I mean, Caldwell's last few years here just because we literally have no idea how much say he had in terms of draft picks and those kind of moves. So it's always hard to have that discussion where, you know, where to place the 2017, 2018, and 2019 drafts on. Like, you know, do we blame Caldwell for Taven Bryan and picking Leonard Fournette over two MVP quarterbacks, or was that all Coughlin? That's really hard to separate. But luckily, you know, uh, for people's sakes, in terms of clarity, when looking at Caldwell's track record, we have those four drafts beforehand. And, I mean, if you look at the four drafts, he kind of – he went – he hit 500 overall, you know, the 2013 class, like you said, was abysmal Um, off top of my head. I don't think any of the players from the class got a second contract with the team. I, I think only one of them, even no, two of them even got a second contract in the NFL. That was Luke Jokel, who was no longer in the NFL and Jonathan Cyprian, who got a deal with the Tennessee Titans. And Shout out to my dog Dwayne Grotz too. I was a big dude. I was be, I was high on Dwayne Grotz. I thought he was, was going to. I thought he was going to be good, man. I, dude, I, him, I, I, him. I bought in completely to the Gus Bradley super long press corner archetype, and I, I, I was all in on Dwayne Grotz. Dwayne Grotz and Alan Ball were a better corner duo than Jalen Ramsey and AJ Boye. Fight me, like I said, correct takes on this podcast only. Yeah, aside from that one. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, <I'm just> <laughs> not, dude, I, Alan Ball was not bad that 2013 season. He he is an underrated name that I'd honestly completely forgot. <laughs> he even played for the Jaguars. Well, dude, there's man. there's just like so much things with that. Like that, I'd say like 2010 through 2013. There were so many players yeah. like on that team that you wanted to buy into because the teams were so bad. You're like. Oh, well, maybe like Cecil yeah. Shorts, bro. Like you remember seeing everybody going to bat with Cecil Shorts. Like, yeah, he's gonna be like, like an elite receiver. I was gonna say, ideally, Cecil Shorts is like a good team's like third best wide receiver. Yeah, but we everybody, you know, Jackson, you know, want him to be, you know, like that, that Pro Bowl type receiver. And the scary thing was, he looked that good in Jack Horse practices. Yeah, exactly. But that's because he was going against you know scrubs. Exactly, man, yeah. and I. And I, and I think the team still kind of has those those guys because, I mean, you talk about, like, the tight end position. A lot of people, yeah. you know, talk about how they want to improve that. I don't know if I'm just buying into James O'Shaughnessy a little bit more than I should, but I kind of really like James O'Shaughnessy. But, you know, not to say I don't want to see them upgrade the position, but, sure. you know, James O'Shaughnessy is still, you know, kind of a dog. Yeah, no, for sure, for sure. And, you know, like what I said, you look at Caldwell's uh, other draft classes. 2014, it, in hindsight – you know, what, what is it? It's like six years down the road now. It is such a strange draft class because, you know, you had Blake Bortles at third overall. Um, I, I don't care any which way you cut it. That was a bust of a draft pick, uh, regardless of the two and one playoff record, the franchise passing records. That was a bust of a draft pick. He played here for five seasons, had a one winning season. That was a terrible draft pick. Uh, in the second round, he took Marquise Lee and then Allen Robinson. I did an article on Dave Caldwell's five best draft picks, and I said Allen Robinson was number four. I would have put him higher, like two or one, if he had actually played longer with the team. But, that I mean, that's just a case of the Jaguars under Caldwell, that he was one of Caldwell's best picks, but he didn't even get a second contract with the team. So while that was a good pick on the surface, they only got three years of football out of him because he missed his entire fourth season. And, you know, uh, other than that, they drafted a few other guys. Brandon Linder, that was a good draft pick. Yeah. Uh, he's still with the team. He's probably, in my opinion, he's called off second best draft pick he's made just in terms of the impact he's made and his consistency and longevity. And then uh, he took Telvin Smith uh, late in, late, later in the draft. Telvin fell because of some issues uh, at the Combine, some questions about his size. Kelvin was a speed demon at FSU, and early on in Jacksonville, he was really good. Like, Telvin Smith, I think, is the best 
linebacker of the 2010s for the Jaguars. You know, I know a lot of 100%. people say Paul Puzlesny, but I, I say Telvin, dude. I, I mean, you agree? I would, I would say Telvin's the best. Um, you know, you see a lot of people talk about Paul Puzlesny, like you said, and I think, you know, most of what they miss is like, I guess his run stopping ability. And he, and he did a lot for the community. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, people are going to attach with that, but like you said, you know, no one matches Telvin Smith with his sideline to sideline speed. You know, yeah. he got interceptions. He got, he was a playmaker. Sixes. Dude. Yeah. He made plays, you know, he was like, uh, popped up on my memories again today, you know, and he was a motivator too. You know, the guys yeah. really in the locker room when they won games, he was hyping the guys up. Like I was, I was going to say Telvin Smith, it's probably, you know, one of his better draft picks, unfortunately, you know, not uh, with the team now. I was going to say that's just like Robinson, you know, fast forward a few years. Uh, he played with Jacksonville one year longer than Allen Robinson. And of course he didn't have an injury uh, ruined year. So he played, he played five seasons at Jacksonville. Robinson was here for four, but played in three. But just like Robinson, uh, Smith was a great pick that didn't end up staying with the team long term. Now, of course, that one isn't really the team's fault, depending on who you ask, because uh, Telvin abruptly announced he would not be playing. He didn't really give any reasons or anything like that. But 2014 draft class was a, a solid one by Caldwell. I think the 2014 draft class is when fans really bought into Dave Caldwell because, I mean, that class early on, you know, it, it produced. I mean, Bortles had a, an abysmal rookie season, but other than that, everybody else looked good. You know, Robinson had a good year. Smith had a good year. Linder had a good year. And then you fast forward to 2015, and arguably the best pick – I don't even think it's arguable at this point. The best pick from the 2015 draft was A.J. Cam. And he's a mediocre yeah. right guard. You know, I mean, yeah. Dante Fowler, uh, it took him third overall. Dante uh, never played on a second contract with Jacksonville. They ended up trading him in the middle of his fourth season. He ended up having a career year with the Rams this year, but I still say that he would not have had that season in Jacksonville for a number of reasons. I think he needed a wake-up call that, hey, maybe a team – doesn't really like what you're doing, your habits on and off the field. You need to change some stuff. And, I mean, you just look at it in Jacksonville. He was not that good, man. I mean, even even his most productive year to hear, he got 10 sacks and then a few in the playoffs. If you go back and watch his sacks from that season, and I remember I did an article on it then, uh, you know, the super positive guy I am. I think it was like seven of those 10 sacks came on like stunts or anything. He, well, he was just coming free across the middle while Calais mm -hmm. Campbell or, or Yannick, you know, took the blockers on the right. And there's value in a player that can do that, but that's not a player I think that you're picking third overall to stunt him yeah. so he can get to the quarterback. I mean, yeah. jo Josh Allen already, you know, ha has had more sacks as a rookie than I think Fowler uh, had almost overall. I want to say he had – about 15 sacks with the Jaguars. Uh, Josh Allen has 10 and a half already. So, well, I mean, and, I, I, and I, oh, sorry about that. But I think that mm -hmm. the biggest thing for Codwell now is player retention. Because yeah. I think that that is, you know, we were going through all this draft class and all the players that, you know, the best players he's drafted have basically left the team. You know, you look at that and people will, you know, make the, Coughlin argument whatever you want to say but I mean at mm -hmm. the end of the day he just does not pay the playmakers he'd rather pay people in free agency that doesn't work out sometimes they will work out I mean you look at guys like AJ Boye Clayus Campbell those guys getting long-term contracts sticking around being you know those guys that help this team but you got players that were you know diamonds in the rough on really bad football teams and he did not want to keep him keep them around and I think that that's one thing that he really, really needs to fix because I think that's the, you know, people want to talk about his draft history. There is some players and I, and I think, you know, he's had some hits in the late rounds and I think that that might be some things where, you know, people are like, well, well maybe, you know, he hits these fifth, fourth, third, sixth, seventh round picks, you know, maybe we should keep him around because he can do that. But, you know, when it comes time to pay your guys that are playing for you and balling for you, you need to do that. You need to be able to bring these guys back in. You need to be able to retain these guys. Because if you don't, then, you know, you're a sinking ship and no one wants to yeah. come here because, you know, after their rookie contract, they're not going to get signed. Now, yeah. one question I have for you is, do you think 
what do you think the limit is with Dave Caldwell? Do you think this is the year that it's like make or break? Or do you think that, you know, with him coming back, he's got a good three, four years left to develop himself? I think I would not be shocked if he got a year beyond this, but I do get the sense that he is tied to Doug Marone at this point. So I think whatever the fate is of one, that's going to be the fate of the other, you know, at one point or another. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think that Khan has, like we had said, you know, in our earlier segment, Khan has seen the years of work he's done. He had two good draft classes in 2014 and 2016, two really bad ones in 2013 and 2015, uh, definitely made some questionable free agency decisions. And uh, like, like you said, most of his best draft picks have walked, and another one could walk soon in Yannick Ngakwe. I'm not sure how much of that's his fault because the only one he was really able to pay was Brandon Linder because, I mean, by the time most guys were set to be paid, Tom Coughlin was here, and he kind of just – set ablaze <laughs> that entire yeah. uh, situation. But, I mean, you look you look at – if you name Dave Caldwell's seven best picks, there's a good chance, what, five of them won't won't be guys that got second contracts with the Jaguars. That is, that, is, that, is, that is just an albatross. That is not how you build a football team. Like you I don't said. even know what that word means. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, that, that's how bad it is. You know, I mean, I, I pulled out the big word because, you know, that's, that's when it gets serious. And I, I just think – I think that Shad Khan has seen enough from Dave Caldwell and Doug Marone, but Caldwell especially, that he's going to tie them together. And I think the big reason he retained Marone and Caldwell, which was panned by a lot of people, you know, not even just fans, but national media, even local media, stuff like that. A lot of people disagreed with that decision. I think the reason he did it was he wants to, while he still has these guys under contract, he wants to see how they can function without Tom Coughlin lurking over them. Because I, I don't think the presence of Tom Coughlin can be understated here. Uh, he, he, the buck stopped with him at TIAA Bank Field. Uh, he essentially put together some of Doug Marone's staffs. I mean, you look at Doug Marone's first staff in Jacksonville. It was almost completely made of guys who had relations to Coughlin and not Marone. So I, I think that Khan's real thinking here is, okay, let's give them a year without this micromanager trying to, you know, do everything the old archaic way. And let's see if we can't build upon that. Because I think you've asked Khan in 2016 about the job Caldwell was doing. I think he would have said he's doing okay, but we need to be better. Because, I mean, they, they were, I believe, 13 and 42 under uh, Gus Bradley. Nope, 14 and 48. That's even worse. So under the coach that – Caldwell hired 14 and 48. Uh, Caldwell had some nice pieces, but they did not win games. So I think that's a big reason Coughlin was brought in in the first place. And I think that's the most confusing part about this. Just the optics of it is so weird because you demoted Caldwell in 2017 because you did not think he was getting the job done. And now you're basically giving him his old job back after – you know, we're we're not in the, you know, the closed door discussions between them. He very well may could have grown during his time uh, under Tom Coughlin. But he basically got demoted and then promoted back to his role without really having to do anything. And I just think the optics of that look pretty weird. Well, and it's a big thing, too, because, you know, from the outside looking in, obviously you're in on the press conferences. You know, you've talked to these guys from, you know, a person that's really not involved in that. It just it's it doesn't seem like Shad Khan is as invested in the team as he should be from the outside looking in. It seems like, you know, he's a guy that bought this team because he had a lot of money. And, you know, his son obviously is really into sports. You know, you look at that with his, you know, his soccer team he owns, AEW, you know, all of that. And it just seems like Shad Khan doesn't have that much of an interest in. See, I, I, I disagree the there. I think he has an interest and wants to win. He's just learning basically as he goes because he came into this blind. And I think That's that fair. is the exact reason why he hired Tom Coughlin to, to begin with. He hired him because he wanted somebody experienced who knows how an NFL franchise is ran to run the franchise. Now, of course, that was a disaster of a hire because the way Tom Coughlin runs the NFL franchise is not the way that you're supposed to no, run one. No. But, the, but the theory, you know, the theory was there. So, I mean, that's, I, I see a lot of people with that take, and 
I personally don't have it. I do think he cares. I just think he is still kind of kind of adjusting to life of a sports owner and having to make those decisions and whatnot. But, I mean, I who knows? Wayne Weaver, you know, probably had to go through the same thing. But he did have Coughlin to basically build a team and its foundation back then. So, I, I see it as Khan really, in his years as a Jaguars owner, other than basically outsing Mike Malarkey after a year, he's been a pretty patient dude. You know, I mean, he, yeah. he, he let Gus Bradley coach for almost four seasons, and they never won more than five games. I mean, you can make an argument that Gus Bradley should have been fired after two seasons. Uh, the, the the fact that he even was a, able to enter or force Stephen as the head coach kind of tells you that Shaw Khan's a pretty patient dude. I mean – Well, I think that's kind of the debate, though, is yeah. that, you know, that from the eyes of, you know, someone like me – you look at it and it's almost like he's too patient. Like he's too patient with these guys and yeah. he's, you know, trying to give these guys opportunities to win games and you know, and they cling I feel like they cling on to that twenty seventeen season like I it's agree. like I agree with that. I agree with that. Like I, I, I tweeted it after they put out the statement that they were bringing back uh Marone and Caldwell. I said that it would serve them well to put twenty seventeen in their rear view mirror put your foot on the gas pedal and do not look back. Get as far away from 2017 as you can in terms of a mindset, because to me, living in the past like that, it's not going to do you any good. And just the complexion of the team is so different now. I mean, th- yeah. there's a handful of guys who are even left from there. There's a handful of coaches who are even left from there. I mean, I, I, I just, and like the identity of that team, the defense, the majority of that defense isn't here anymore. So I, I think they should use 17 as, you know, kind of a mark to say this is what we want to be. But stop saying, like, okay, we did this a few years ago. We can probably replicate it if we just tweak something here or there. 100% agree with that. Yeah, so I'm, I'm with you. Um, I, I wasn't too surprised when I heard that Caldwell was retained. I, I had kind of said, you know, throughout this entire season that if I thought anybody was going to stay with the Jaguars, it was going to be Dave Caldwell because – I thought he could make the argument that, you know, we said that he can basically say, hey, my hands have been tied for three years. Uh, the guys I drafted and wanted to re-sign, uh, Tom ran out of town. So that, that didn't surprise me at all that Dave came back. I always kind of expected him to be back, to be frank. I did not really I, – I would need to go back to our old podcast, but I think I even said then, like, I don't envision a scenario where he's not back. So that didn't surprise me. Uh, Marone coming back, I it didn't shock me. But when the statement came, it kind of felt like we were all expecting it. But it was still kind of yeah. surreal to see. You, you know what I mean? Well, and I mean, and like you like you said, you know, you got to look back at the old podcast. I think we were both kind of in agreement with that. Like you said earlier, like I think Caldwell and Marone are so linked at this point that if they were going to bring one back, the other one's going to be brought back by default. It was never going to be one or the other. Like it was always going to be those two. And then the one guy that we obviously thought wasn't going to be around was Todd Wash. You know, there was points in the season where there was an argument to be made that Wash should have been fired. Yeah. and, you know, to be frank, I'm kind of surprised by the one person. And he didn't get fired necessarily, but the one person that left, you know, I'm, I'm honestly surprised Flip left. You know, I think that that was kind of, a, kind of a shocking development, I'd say. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I mean, that, that kind of can transition us perfectly, you know, really into our next, uh, our next part. You know, we talked a lot of Marone Caldwell. And I, I, I do want to talk a little bit about the press conference after that. But I think we need to talk about, obviously, the big news this week is the Jaguars yesterday mutually parted ways with offensive coordinator John DeFilippo. DeFilippo had been the team's uh, signal caller uh, for less than 365 days. You know, he was only there for the 2019 season. Uh, this was only a year after he coached 13 games for Minnesota Vikings. And just a few years ago, he was a, a Cleveland Browns offensive coordinator for one season. So he kind of has a track record of being a one-and-done offensive coordinator. This is the third time it's happened to him since 2015, which is kind of wild, honestly. But I think if it was a straight-up, like, Doug Marone saying, hey, you're fired, we want to go a different direction – I think they would have just said so. I mean, they, they said so when they when they fired Coughlin. You know, they said he was relieved yeah. of his duties. They've said so constantly under Maroon when they've let coaches go. 
I truly do think this was a mutual decision from the both sides to say, we each want to go in different directions. Now I'm not reporting that or anything like that. I'm just saying that is what I got from the statement the team put out saying it was a mutual decision to part ways. And I don't think it's hard to connect the dots. I mean, Tom Coughlin was the biggest Nick Foles advocate inside of TIA bank field. Did not get that, you know, mistaken at all. But after him, John Day Filippo is probably number two, I'd say, just in their yeah. due to their experience together and the fact that he built a playbook around Nick Foles. And it wouldn't surprise me if Doug Marone said, Hey, I think uh, you know, we're gonna go with Gardner in twenty twenty. And is is that something that you'd want to be a part of? And if Dave Filippo said no, that's not something that would shock me. Obviously, I'm not saying 100%. that happened, but I'm just saying hypothetically, you know, I could see that kind of scenario playing out. So Doug had said, you know, two weeks ago at a press conference when he got retained that he would be evaluating his staff on the 13th. Uh, well, the 13th came and uh, Dave Filippo was the only really uh, change from it. So, I mean, g- give me your general reaction to it, Treve. I mean, wh- how did you really react to Flip being gone? I'll, I'll give mine, of course, but I, I just want to hear your thoughts. And if you think it's a good move or a bad move for either side. Well, I got I got two takes. First of all, I was literally exactly what you explained was kind of what I took away from it. You know, when I heard it was kind of a mutual thing, you know, you'd you'd think Doug Marone probably went in there and said, hey, you know, Gardner's going to be the guy next year or maybe even – I'm not advocating for this, but maybe the Jags draft a guy and maybe they want them to be the guy and, you know, they're going to try and do something with Nick Foles and, you know, he's just not going to be the guy next year. So that was something that they disagreed on. Flip's like, I can't handle that. You know, I'm going to go. I'm going to part ways with y'all. And I think, honestly, it it was weird to me because it seemed like Flip called better plays when Minshew was out there. Like, it seemed like Flip had that chemistry with Minshew a little bit more than he did with Nick Foles. I don't know if you can credit that to just, you know, play on the field in general, but it seemed like Flip was calling winning plays for Gardner Minshew out there. And, you know, with an exciting young guy like Minshew, you know, it's kind of hard to believe that a guy would want to leave that situation. But, you know, you look at the franchise, the state of the franchise, you know, it's in such, I wouldn't say shambles right now, but it's, you know, it's a questionable. Yeah, a crossroads, I'd say. Yeah, yeah, it's a questionable place to be. And, you know, I'm not too surprised yeah. as to uh, as to why, yeah, for you know, sure. he, he left. And, you know, thing number two is that Cole Fartley, I'm never going to trust anything <laughs> you ever tweet in yeah, my entire I had, life. I had the double take, too. I, 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 you're, you're not the only one. I had the double take. He, Cole- he literally screenshotted my tweet and I deleted it. I don't <laughs> even know how he got it. <laughs> Bricker. Cole doesn't sleep, dude. Cole, Cole is all about causing mayhem on, on the TL. So I, 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 I had the same exact really reaction. Uh, I saw a lot of people being like, oh, no, this is the wrong coordinator to be leaving. He did a good job, that kind of stuff. Gardner needs to have continuity in an offense. The Jaguars' offense was terrible <laughs> in 2019. Like, well, I, where, where, where were Gardner people... was making the plays. I, I was going to say, like, don't get me wrong. I thought Gardner had a good rookie season, especially considering the circumstances and where he was taken. But the overall offensive output, if you're looking from the job of an offensive coordinator, they were 31st in first half points uh, per game, 7.3. You know how many first half points per game they scored in 2018 when Leonard Fournette had the worst year of his football career? and Blake Bortles and Cody Kessler were starting, 7.7. They were a better first-half offense in 2018, one of the worst offensive years in franchise history than they were in 2019. And you can argue, uh, you know, Dave Filippo had better weapons at his disposal in 2019. You know, I mean, DJ Chark elevated his game. Fournette had the best year of his career. They had a healthy offensive line with Jawan Taylor at right tackle anchoring that. Brandon Linder didn't miss any games. Uh, Nick Foles played like Bortles and Kessler for four games, but in the other 12 games, I'd say Minshew, while not perfect, was an upgrade over any of those three guys. So, I mean, you, you look at all the statistics, third down conversion percentage, red zone trips turned into touchdowns percentage. Jaguars were ranked like 26 or lower in pretty much every important offensive statistic. In terms of continuity, I think it's more important to have continuity within a good offense than to continue to run it back with something 
that obviously is not working. And I think the fact that the Jaguars are so poor in the red zone, so poor on third yeah. down, and so yeah. poor at scoring early in the game is an indication of bad coaching and bad game plans because that is the stuff that I think falls a lot on coaches. You know, I mean, a lot of early game stuff and red zone stuff is scripted. If it's not working, that that obviously a lot of it has to do with execution, but a lot of it has to do with the plays you're calling and how you're teaching it as well. So, I, I mean, me personally, a guy that, you know, talked to Dave Filippo a good bit at press conferences and stuff, I thought he was a smart guy. I like talking football with him, but results are results. They scored less than 19 points per game. Um, if Even if they didn't decide to mutually part ways, I think the offense is bad enough to merit him being fired if they wanted to fire him. So I, I, I just I, – I saw a lot of reactions to that, being surprised and a lot of upset reactions. I didn't really get, get that feel at all. I, I thought it was a move that honestly could end up being one that was the right one to make. I think that the big thing was is that, you know, I didn't get, like, upset vibes from it, but I think the big thing was was the shock that he got fired over Todd Wash. I think that was the biggest and, – and, and, and I think a lot of – and that and that's kind of uh that's what this podcast is for you know tree dishes out his takes and john you know proves me wrong and then it makes a lot of <laughs> sense when he when he spits facts to me and you know you made a lot of good points there but you know i think that was kind of just a general reaction was that you know todd wash is still sticking around and then oh, you for know, sure. they fire flip first and i think that that was the most shocking part of it and you know it, as you said it, you know, Minshew, I think, was the guy that was out there making the plays. It wasn't necessarily the play calling. You know, I tell, I tell everybody that'll listen that, you know, I could literally sit there and tell you every single Jags play that they're going to run before they run it. And it's, just, it's a predictable offense. And, you know, hopefully they can get somebody in there that uh, will cater to Minshew and will uh, develop this offense. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And I completely understand that point as well. And, you know, I empathize with fans. You know, I'm, I'm not somebody who's kind of, you know, hindering my emotions on, uh, you know, what the Jaguars do, that kind of stuff. But I completely understand their reactions just because I don't think there's any way you can look at the defense from 2019 and make a case for Todd Wash being retained. You know, a good case. The only argument I think he even has that any of his supporters can make is, hey, our defensive personnel literally got worse each week because, you know, guys getting hurt, uh, the best cornerback in football being traded, that kind of stuff. You know, I mean, in a few cases, he had to play with guys, you know, off the street, especially at linebacker. Like, Austin Calitro doesn't start at linebacker for a winning football team. I mean, that's just that's just Any football team. Day. Yeah, I mean, and so I, I think that's probably the only argument him or his supporters can make. I would hope – uh, for the Jaguars' sake, that Doug Marone would not buy into that argument and that he would see, hey, this scheme got gashed first of the run. Our personnel doesn't even fit the scheme. We didn't change anything up. We came out with bad game plans. And even before the Jaguars' defense got banged up, uh, you know, like in week one against the Kansas City Chiefs, completely healthy Jaguars' defense, Sands, Marcel Darius, they got absolutely shredded by Patrick Mahomes. Now, Mahomes does that to any defense, but it was the ways they were doing it. Sammy Watkins had like 80% of his overall production for the 2019 season in that one game alone. Sammy Watkins didn't catch any other touchdowns in 2019 other than in week one for against the fantasy for that whole freaking reason. Yeah, yeah, you and me both. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> I, I ended up dropping him after a couple of weeks because I was just like, okay, this was just this was just Jaguars. That, that was Jaguar it. football, dude. Yeah, bas basically, dude. Like – you can make the argument that Mahomes kills every defense and it's a good argument to make, but you have to look at how it happens. And there were dudes are running wide open, man. I mean, especially looking at it from the press box, you can get a whole, you know, whole field view of it. And I could tell you guys were scoring touchdowns 15 seconds before they cross, you know, the goal line because they were just coming open instantly. You had Quincy Williams covering Tyreek Hill on a wheel route. It, it was just some insane stuff schematically. And then well, you Quincy go to Williams week. is so speedy, John. Yeah, that he that is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I still remember the theories that he would be able to step in and basically do what Telvin did right away. Yeah. Because Telvin had a bad 2018 season. I think they missed Telvin and Malik Jackson more than they missed any other two players in 2019. Would you agree with that? I agree. I would agree with that 100%. 100%. And Marcel, obviously. Yeah, yeah, of course. And, I mean, e even to the point of Marcel, uh, that was actually be my next point about Wash's defense. 
in week five against the Carolina Panthers, uh, the Jaguars had one of the worst defensive performances in franchise history, just considering how much they were gashed against the run. Marcel Darius played in that game. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Miles Jack played in that game. You know, uh, they, they were very healthy for that game. They didn't have Jalen Ramsey, obviously, but it's not like Kyle Allen was dropping, you know, bombs Dimes, over Trey Herndon's yeah. head. I mean, that, and to me, that week was the week that you look at Wash's defense and say, this is not working because they kept doing the same thing schematically and the Panthers came out doing the same exact thing as well. And they were just gashing the Jaguars. This is a get up the field, aggressive scheme. You're not flowing downhill. You, you know, you're really going sideline to sideline. You're supposed to trust your aggressiveness and your speed. And they have just completely deteriorated. And I don't think they have the personnel to make that scheme work. I think you have to have a personnel full of pro bowlers to make that scheme work. Hence 2017, hence the Seattle Seahawks Super Bowl teams where they had pro bowlers at every level of the defense. If you need to have that kind of talent for the scheme to work, I don't think that's a scheme that needs to stay in place. I don't think Todd Wash knows how to coach any other scheme. And I don't think there's any good reason for Todd Wash to be coaching the Jaguars defense in 2020. I would agree with everything you said, 100%, my guy. Yeah, I mean, uh, do, do you expect him to still be there? I, uh, like, like, my brain's saying no, but my, my Jaguar mind is saying 100% he'll be there and get fired like week six of the season next yeah. year. I, I feel like they're going to basically move on from him that we've done that already. You know, I mean, D- that's D- what I'm thinking too. D- Doug Marone was at East West uh, Shrine Ball practices today. So I'm, I'm, I'm not reporting anything, obviously, but I think you can kind of assume that he did his staff meetings yesterday. And if you're going to move on from him, wouldn't you have done it yesterday when you moved on from Flip? Exactly. I mean, that's, and that's what you said, you know, he's going to evaluate his coaching staff on the 13th and the only move he made was Flip. So, I mean, Todd Wash memes all 2021 and yeah so I mean so. maybe he surprises us and you know does a switch later on uh but I just I think Todd Wash is going to be there in 2020 and I do not think it's a good idea at all so I would even if they knocked the draft out of the park I'd expect a down year defensively but you know that that's just my perspective on it but I mean I think that's another part of bringing Marone and Caldwell back if I'm Sean Khan. I would have told Marone, you can come back in 2020, but you need to have a new defensive coordinator. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that the, you need to set some sort of stipulation. It was probably some of the long lines of that, but, uh, you know, he probably told Marone, you know, you need to sit, you need to evaluate you guys. And when he did that, you know, Wash was probably just like talking to Doug and said, you know, I want a job, I want to be here, you know, and showing that he wants to be here. And then with Flip, it's like, you know, if you're not going to go with Foles, I don't want to be here, I don't want to be this guy. So, you know, that's probably why Flip ended up going and, you know, either giving Wash another crack at the bat. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I think Wash and Doug, I do think, you know, as coaches, as coworkers, I do think they click. I never really got a great sense that Doug and Flip did. So I think, I think Wash and Marone have a better working relationship, at least on the surface. But again, I just I, I I don't see the positives to bringing him back, but I do expect it to happen. So I mean, I, there's several defensive coaches you could bring in that I think would be better than Wash, and you don't even have to change the three four to be better. I think you just have to change your principles on defense in the four three. But at this point, I am expecting Todd Wash to be the Jaguars' defensive coordinator in 2020 so I mean that's that that's the bed that it looks like they're making and it's going to be one that they have they have to sleep in but I mean a bad a Todd Walsh returning in 2020 likely means a bad defense a bad defense likely means a bad season and a bad season means Doug Marone and Dave Caldwell are likely ousted unless Shad Khan gives Dave Caldwell his fifth life or whatever so I mean it's 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 all connected so I I just I'm surprised, honestly. That that that's really my only thing. I, I I think a lot of people aren't surprised just because it's seems like it's a typical Jaguar move. Yeah, exactly. To keep to keep Wash, but I just thought, man, after these last few seasons, how can you? You know, but it it appears there will be. Yeah, I think, um, like you said, you know, they're making the bed. They got to lie in it. 
if it's another terrible Jaguar season, then, you know, this is going to be kind of, it's going to be interesting to see even next off season to see where this team goes and who they have and what they have to build around. It could be a complete rebuild by next year. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So, I mean, it'll, it'll be interesting, but we will see what, what really uh, happens with uh, Marone, Wash and Caldwell. Marone and Wash are obviously going to be given, you know, another year to kind of fix things in Jacksonville. So we're going to see if they'll be able to. But I, I think at the end of the day, you know, they just – I think they need to show substantial improvement from 2019 and 2018 to keep their jobs. You know, I, I really do think that it, that the last straw would be, a, you know, a six-win or a five-win season with a losing streak as bad as it was in 2019. I mean, do you agree with that? Or do you think, like, six and ten, seven and nine brings them back? I'd agree with that. And, you know, you look at – Houston and Tennessee obviously winning their playoff games obviously Houston got dominated against Kansas City you got Tennessee in the AFC championship game now and it's crazy that they're giving them this one last life in 2020 basically is a win or go home season for the Jaguars and I just don't think this is a team built yeah. for that yeah and I, I I wrote a story uh you know after the wild card round there were so many things the Jaguars could learn from <laughs> the Titans yeah, and, and the Texans. Exactly. Like, invest in quarterback, build around your quarterback, let the scheme work for him, uh, you know, build your scheme around your defense, which, which I think both teams have done. You know, they've made their schemes fit their personnel. Obviously, it didn't work out for the Texans uh, last Sunday, but it's worked out really well for the Titans. They have a lot of different, you know, versatile pieces that, they they have so many different pieces up front and in the secondary that I don't even think, like, you look at them from the outside and you can say, okay, this is a roster that will run a 4-3 or will run a 3-4. They just have a lot of talented players, and they put them in the right positions to succeed. And I think that's the big thing the Jaguars don't do. And that's where things really stand right now with Marone and Caldwell and the Jaguars coordinator spots. Uh, I wrote an article on a few potential offensive coordinator candidates the Jaguars could or really should, you know, really reach out to. If you want to read that on Jaguar Maven, I think there's a few names that really make sense there. I also did one about the quarterback's coach position. Uh, so, at the end of the day, obviously, you know, the Jaguars have a lot of decisions still coming up in 2020. Figuring out who's going to be leading the offense and defense are going to be two of those major decisions. But with that said, we're now going to segue from – our very positive uh, Doug Marone and Dave Caldwell talk yeah. to uh, handing out some awards to the Jaguars for, uh, you know, their 2019 performances. Really, you know, our superlatives for the 2019 season. So, uh, Treve, go ahead and take it away, buddy. Well, first of all, I want to give a big shout-out to Jags Twitter for voting in these polls, mostly from the help of the Jaguar Maven Twitter page, of course. You know, we got we got a lot of, a lot of votes um, in the polls, and I'm very – Happy for that. And I think so. We have a total of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven awards. So we got seven awards. Some of them are, are dis awards because, you know, uh, as being Jags fans, we can't be positive 100% of the time, let alone 50% of the time, most of the time. So starting things off with the most improved Jaguar player of the season. Now we're going to present it Oscar style. I'm not going to, I'm not going to go off on a political rant or anything, but I'm going to read off the nominees. So we have Dewan Smoot who came in and had six sacks this season. And I got, I got roasted by big cat country by saying his progression was really good, but you know, I, I think it was great. I think he, he came around, he played really solid football. You got DJ Chark who of course, leaps and bounds from last year I mean he only had 200 receiving yards last year coming in you know this year with a thousand yards we had Leonard Fournette who had the best career I mean best season of his career so far had over 100 targets in 2019 did well on the ground and you know developed his pass catching skills as well and then we got uh John's favorite guy Taven Bryan you know Taven Bryan was a was a guy that I think you know not not a lot of people really gave a lot of credit for for improving this year but you know, from his rookie season to now, I think he's came leaps in bounds. Yeah, so, sure. 510 total votes. The people of the Jaguar Maven community, with over 76% of the vote, 
voted DJ Chark as the most improved Jaguar player in 2019. John, is that who you would have voted for? Yeah, that's 100% who I would have voted for. I mean, Chark didn't look like an NFL wide receiver in 2018. In 2019, he was in the top 10 of most AFC receiving stats. He cracked 1,000 receiving yards. He had eight touchdowns. He was a big, big time uh, vertical threat. He made a lot of highly real catches. And he, he showed that he has the talent. And considering his age, you know, he's only 22, 23 years old, he has the talent to really grow into something special. So I definitely would have gave that to him. And just as a side note, uh, Big Cat Country, Ryan Day, good friend of mine. I've known him for many, many years. You can suck it about the Wayne Smoot. Dude went from having zero <laughs> sacks in three years to six. Exactly. In so, all right. <laughs> Go ahead, Drew. <laughs> We're going to start Twitter beef with Big Cat Country. Is there, uh, is there anybody else you would have added to that list, or do you think that those are probably the four most important? Oh, guys? man. Um, I think maybe – I mean, Trey Herndon didn't get enough run in 2018. He only really played that Eagles game. Uh Ronnie Harrison improved a bit, I think, just not as much as I would say those guys, just because, you know, while he improved, he wasn't a disaster in 2018. So I, I, I'd say there's probably the right guys. I would say I would also agree with the DJ Chark vote there, like you said, leaps and bounds. And if you look back at any of my 2018 YouTube videos about DJ Chark, I would go off on him an unnecessary amount. Because, like, it, when he would drop the ball, he looked so awkward. Like, he was just so awkward out there. He was tall. He was skinny. And, like, literally the whole time, I was like, I wish you weren't so awkward. So, you know, he came in in 2019, proved he wasn't awkward, proved he could be a number one wide receiver. Coming in second place in that vote was Leonard Fournette, who that is expected. He had 13.5. And Dwayne Spoot got more votes than Taven Bryan. He came in at 6.7. And Taven Bryan came in last with 3.5% of the vote. And the next award is the Offensive Player of the Year. Now, this one only had three nominations. Uh, just a quick, yeah, just three nominations. Uh, those nominees were Leonard Fournette. Obviously, we got into him. We got into him and DJ Chark. And, of course, the third nominee was quarterback Gardner Minshew. Going 6-6 six and six as a starting quarterback, he was very exciting to watch. Obviously, a big fan of him. And uh, my... Gardner, if you're watching this and you're in your RV going through the United States of America, you come through Idaho, it's a little snowy, we can go sledding, dog. I'm 21 now, we can go out to a bar, bro. And, you know, you can get an exclusive interview on Jaguar Maven. You could be a guest on the Jaguar Maven podcast. I mean, what, <laughs> else, what else do you want? So coming in with the win with 70, 749 votes, the man that wins the Offensive Player of the Year award from the fans is Gardner Minshew with 46.9% of the vote. John, is that who you would have voted for? Oh, man. It, I'd still say, honestly, I'd go Chark just because I don't think he had the bouts of really inconsistency that Minshew had at times. And Minshew was a big part of them winning every one of the six games that they won. I just think on a week-in and week-out basis, DJ Chark was the best player on the offense. I think that there was a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of fanboys voting on that one because I, I would have gave it to DJ Chark too. I think, uh, man, actually, you know, I'd probably give it to Leonard Fournette. I think Fournette was a big piece of the offense, uh, catching the ball and running the ball. And I think leaps and bounds this year, I probably would have gave it to Leonard Fournette over DJ Chark yeah. and Gardner Minshew. My, my, yeah. my only reason I didn't go Fournette is he only scored three touchdowns. And, and the second half of the season, uh, I, I didn't realize this until I looked at his box scores the other day doing a story on him. He didn't have a 100-yard rushing game after uh, the Cincinnati game. Wow. See, that's yeah. what I'm talking about. John dropping knowledge on me, making me look foolish. Just kidding. <laughs> no, course, I, mean, I had the same idea that, like, if you told me how many 100 yard games Len Fournette had in the second half of the season, I'd be like, oh, he probably had, like, what, like three? But no, nah, he, he, he did a good bulk of his damage in the first half. So, Gardner, of course, received 46.9, nice percent of the votes. DJ Chark came in second with 26.3, and Leonard Fournette came in with 26%. Is there anybody else you'd add to that list? Maybe mm. Jawan Taylor? I mean, it's hard for an O-lineman. But yeah, maybe not, I, I don't think so, just because Jawan's holding penalties. I think those guys were the three, you know, clear, clear-cut clear top guys on the offense. All right, so moving in to the defensive player of the year, we have 
Josh Allen, Yannick Ngakwe, Calais Campbell, and Ronnie Harrison. Not a lot of people were big Ronnie Harrison guys. I thought he kind of came in and had a decent season this year. Pretty good, I think, yeah. uh, deserving of that fourth nominee. Uh, would you have put anybody else at that fourth nominee spot, or do you think these are, you know, the four right guys? <laughs> no, nah, I think I think those are the four right guys. I mean, I, I think those are the four guys you can say the most positive stuff about. All right, so the winner – of the Defensive Player of the Year for the Jaguars is a man that isn't even nominated for Rookie of the Year, Josh Allen, receiving 50.5% of the votes. Was that the right call, John? I think just from a production point of view, I don't think you could have gone anybody but Josh Allen. I mean, was he as consistently disruptive as, you know, say, Yannick Ngakwe on a down-to-down basis? Maybe not, but dude made a lot of big plays and a lot of big moments. A lot of his sacks were on third down to get the Jaguars off the field. So I, I would have given it to Josh Allen. I just I think it's shocking to me. Obviously, you know, Josh Allen's been snubbed all season long, but you know, you look at the Pro Bowl votes, like Yannick and Gawkway didn't make the team, but Calais Campbell did. Not to say Campbell didn't have a good season, but I'm a little shocked that he would get that over Yannick and Gawkway. I, I I'll be honest, as good of a season as I thought Calais had, I was surprised he made the Pro Bowl. Because I mean he I had six too. six and a half sacks, eleven tackles for loss, and two forced fumbles. He had a solid season. I just I, I didn't know that he had a Pro Bowl season especially compared to his teammates. Because, I mean, you look you look at production, he had the third best season on the Jaguars' defensive line. Yeah, 100%. So, Josh Allen, of course, received 50.5% of the vote. Yannick Ngakwe, the man that everybody wants to get paid, got 36.3% coming in second. Clayus Campbell at 12.4%. And, like I said, Ronnie Harrison only got 0.8% of the votes. Surprised he even received a vote, to be honest. 388 total votes on that one. And <laughs> this one was another landslide victory. And this is one of those dishonorable awards. And it is who didn't live up to the expectations this year for the Jaguars. The nominees are Nick Foles, Cam Robinson, D.D. Westbrook, and Miles Jack. John, would you add anybody else to that list or subtract anybody? Uh, I, I think I'd probably go ahead and keep that list. I mean, I, I think those are the clear cut guys. So the man that won with 63.8% of the vote, John, do you know who it is? Uh, I'm going to guess uh, the $88 million quarterback who started four games. <laughs> Easy peasy, Nick Foles. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I was victory. going out on a limb on, on that one. <laughs> yeah. I think this one was one of the, uh, one of the most obvious awards. Um, coming in second was Miles Jack. What do you think was so disappointing about Miles Jack this year that, you know, with his play uh, on the field? I. I think that just both first to run and the pass, he second-guessed himself too often. He was trying to make too much happen. You know, a lot of missed tackles, a lot of times out of his gap. I would honestly say he's the most disappointing player, just in terms of my own expectations, just because I didn't think Nick Foles was going to be good in any scenario this season. I thought Miles would at least have a solid season. So for him to play as poorly as he did in 2019, that was a surprise to me. I honestly – I mean, it's hard to deny Nick Foles, but I mean, a close runner-up for me would be Miles Jack. In third, we had Cam Robinson with 7.1% of the vote. What was so disappointing about Cam Robinson in your eyes this year? Uh, the, the pass blocking just was not there technique-wise. I mean, I'm not sure how much of it was him recovering from his ACL injury, but just so many times he it, – it was jarring to see how much better Juwan Taylor's pass blocking technique was than Cam Robinson's in his rookie season. And the fourth and final man, uh, 5.7% of the vote was D.D. Westbrook. Um, Looking at the stats, I would say D.D., you know, he had a productive season, but from the expectation level of where a lot of people had him, you know, obviously a lot of people thought this was going to be the number one wide receiver in Jacksonville. Would you say he had a disappointing season, or would you say it's just based off of pure expectations? I think it's based off pure expectations because I think if you look at just the facts about D.D. Westbrook, he's a solid number three receiver. But a lot of people were talking about him like a dude that was about to, you know, put up 1,000 yards and 10 touchdowns. I think, you know, 600 yards, three touchdowns. You'd like to see a few more scores in there, but I I think that was about on par with how he is. All right, and then the next award is the game of the year. The Jaguars had six victories this year. We put four of them on there. 
Um, we have against the Titans in week three on Thursday Night Football when they travel to Denver week four when they finished off the Raiders in Oakland in their last home game of the season. And, of course, the week 17 victory against Indianapolis. Would you put any of the other two wins on there, or would you say these are the <laughs> That's so funny that we can say any of the other two wins. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't think so. Yeah, I mean, just because the Cincinnati win was pretty, you know, meh. And the and, Jets. Yeah. yeah, and the Jets win. It, I mean, it was a good win, but it was, it was the Jets. So, no, I wouldn't. So the winner, and this one was the closest, or second closest, because uh, we'll get into another one here in a little bit, second closest uh, vote from the fans, received 318 votes, and with 41.2% of the votes, they chose Tennessee Titans week three on Thursday night football. It was Minshew's coming out party. It was his first win. It was under the lights. It was on primetime. Obviously, he got that interview. You really got to see his dad for the first time, and, you know, he's He's one of he's part of the Gardner Minshew flair as his dad as well. Uh, is that the game that you would vote for for game of the year? Yeah, I, I honestly think so. Just with the excitement around that game and how it played out, I think just looking at it from a pure entertainment standpoint, yeah, I would. So um, coming in second was the Denver game in week four. And third was the Colts game in week 17. And I was really shocked the Raiders game came in last place. Personally, if I was voting for game of the year, I would have voted for the Raiders game. It was a come from behind victory. It was the last game in Oakland and the Jags came away with it. Are you surprised at all that that finished last or did you think that would finish? Yeah, I am surprised it finished last because I, I, I'm, I'm with you. I would have thought it would have finished a, a little better than that just in, because of how the game played out. And really, you know, the, the fact that the Jaguars – we're playing in the last game in the Coliseum. Like it, that, that game's going to be shown on NFL network in like 40 years. Yeah, exactly. So I'm a little, a little shocked by that. I'm also shocked that Denver got, are you shocked Denver plays second? No, I'm not just because it was kind of Minshew's like, you know, welcome to the NFL moment in terms of like excitement. That's true. I'll, I'll give you that. And the second to last poll the most disappointing defeat of the season. We had 10 options. We put four of them on there. <laughs> <laughs> that's never going to not be funny to me. Yeah. <laughs> and that's never not going to happen with the Jags not receiving double-digit losses. Anyway, so we have week one against the Chiefs, week two against the Texans, week 12 when they traveled to Tennessee, and week 14 versus the Chargers. Would you have thrown any of the other six losses on there other than those four? <laughs> Jeez. Uh <laughs> I, I don't think so. I mean, all the losses were pretty bad outside of a couple of close ones, but I, I don't think so. So in a tight race, 35.4 to 42.3%, 291, vo 291 votes. The Week 12 game at Tennessee won the most disappointing loss of the season. This was actually the only game I missed in, in uh, 2019. Ooh, lucky would you. you. Would you – yeah, would you would you agree that this was the most disappointing? I'd go with the Chargers game just because the Titans game was close in the first half. I mean, the the Titans put up thirty five points or whatever in the third quarter, but the Chargers game it was over at halftime. So I, I personally, I'd go to the Chargers game just because that was pure domination from start to finish. I think I think when you look at the keyword of disappointing, I probably would have voted Week Two against the Texans. You know, the going for two for the win and you know everything like that. I think that that was. That was a heartbreaker, I think. Yeah, for sure, for sure. For the Jags. Okay, and the final vote of the season, who was the MVP for the Jacksonville Jaguars in 2019? The nominees were Yannick Ngakwe, DJ Chark, Leonard Fournette, and the elite kicker in Jacksonville, Josh Lambeau. Would you throw anybody else out there, replace somebody with somebody else? I think Josh Allen would – probably deserve to get on there over y Yannick just because of his production against the run and the pass. But I don't think it's, you know, like a real big argument to make because unique, I, I thought I had a solid season. For sure. For sure. So coming in, we're going to, we're going to do, we're going to like tense this up a little bit coming in last place with 13.4% of the vote was yeah. Yannick and Gawkway. Of course, you kind of talked about that a little bit. You know, there was a debate to be had that maybe Josh Allen should have been yeah. above him. And coming in second to last was Leonard Fournette, the running back. And I also want to, uh, before I reveal second in first place, 
I do want to point out Gardner Minshew did receive some votes in the mentions. Uh, one of them got 13 likes. So obviously some people had to go to bat for Minshew as well. So coming in second place was wide receiver DJ Chark. And your 2019 Jaguars MVP is kicker Josh Lambeau. John, what do you think? Uh, I, I've said this a few times, but I would have still given it to a Chark just because would Lambeau have kicked as many field goals if the Jaguars <laughs> were not as terrible in the red zone as they were? I mean that sincerely. He was clutch, but – Part of me feels like a big reason for his good season was the Jaguars were so bad on offense. Meanwhile, Chark scored eight touchdowns. I mean, t- t- touchdowns how you win football games. So I'm, I'm gonna go with Chark. That's fair. You know, I knew I knew by me putting Lambo in the poll that people were gonna vote for Lambo right away. I knew yeah. That that uh, oh, 100 percent, 100 percent. Jaguars Twitter loves Lambo. And I would also like to give out an award for the best managing editor of a Jaguars site, John Shipley. Uh, hundred <laughs> percent of the votes. Oh, I, I, I think the vote was a little rigged there. You know, maybe somebody yeah. stole that election, but <laughs> appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, you bet, bro. Well, I mean, uh, Tree, th- thanks for doing that. I mean, I, I think Jaguars Twitter, you know, got a big kick out of it, and there, there's not too many of those, you know, that I even disagree with. Hopefully, this time next season, uh, we can have a little more hotly debated uh, superlatives, uh, you know, on the chance that more than six or seven people have a good season. <laughs> so, yeah, no you know, shit. Not, knock, on word, knock on wood for uh, that one. But uh, th- thank you for doing that. Thank you, everybody, for participating in that. Uh, you know, it's going to be an annual thing here at Jaguar Maven. Uh, we did something similar at the halfway point of the season. I didn't do a Twitter poll, but I made a couple of videos and picked my uh, – you know, uh, superlatives, and a, a lot of them ended up basically, you know, similar to how we ended up doing it for the end of the year. I think the only big difference was I said Leonard Fournette was the most improved player at the halfway point, which I think at the halfway point he was because that, that's when he was on his, like, monster tear of the season. So, uh, I, Treep, I give it that. Yeah, so, Treep, thanks for doing that, man. Uh, lastly, we're going to move into some of our questions that we got via Twitter. Uh, as always, Jaguar Twitter, thank you for, you know, interacting with us, no matter how apathetic the questions are. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and start with B. Jordan Logue. He said, is there a real possibility of a 3-4 defense, and what would it look like? I think if Todd Walsh is a defensive coordinator, there is no chance of a 3-4 defense. His entire background is 4-3. Uh, Dom Capers knows the 3-4 principles, and there's not even a guarantee that he's going to be anywhere near the coaching staff in 2020. So, no, I, I do not envision a 3-4 defense unless they surprise us and hire a new coordinator. Yeah, 100%. If Todd Wash is sticking around and it looks like that is the move, I don't think a 3-4 is possible. I know that there's a ton of people clamoring for that, but I, I don't see it. I think that that's, it stays how it is. Yeah, for sure, for sure. All right, next question from a Cass CDE. Where does Isaiah Simmons fit in this in this defense, assuming Wash is still a defensive coordinator? Me, I would put him at weak side linebacker and just let him fly. I I, I would put him there, just ask him, really, you know, not put too much on his plate at first. But I would make him your defensive weapon in terms of taking away the other team's best player. Imagine if they had Isaiah Simmons this year against Darren Waller during the Oakland game or Christian yeah. McCaffrey during the Carolina Panthers game. He, he is an X factor that they currently do not have. Miles Jack is not that guy. And so I would put him at weak side linebacker, and I would basically make him a chess piece in terms of following the other team's best offensive, uh, you know, skill player that week. I, I think, you know, you see he's so diverse. He can do so many things for your yeah. defense and, and make a lot of plays. I just, I just want to say I almost sounded really stupid before I answered that question because at first I thought you said, like, AZ. I'm like, who is that? And I was like, is this a draft prospect I've never heard of? And I was going to be like, uh, John, we're going to have to cut this one out. But, yeah, def- definitely, you know, trying to shut down playmakers. He's an incredible player, an incredible prospect. and uh, For sure. I mean, just does. just the way Clemson used him in that national championship last night. Yeah, exactly. they, they literally had him do so many different things. And it's not like Deion Jordan coming out of Oregon where he's – fake versatile like he on Jordan lined up in a slot and covered a guy that didn't throw the ball to a few times and had people think okay this is a pass rusher that can also cover the slot that was not the case whatsoever obviously but I, I think Isaiah Simmons is actually you know 
a legit versatile chess piece. I think he can be a guy used a lot like Darwin James, a lot like Tyran Matthew. A uh, guy asked me last night, are there any good positionless players uh, on defense in the NFL? I listed like 10, so I mean, you yeah. go ahead and check those. Okay, next question. From uh, A, it's ESPN. He said, is the flip field parting ways connected to any potential of foals being cut or traded? I, I'm not sure if it's in any connection to that. I do think that Gardner Minshew was always going to be the starter in 2020. And I think this only kind of moves that theory more in that direction, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think the biggest thing was that uh, Doug probably came up to him, said, Minshew's the guy. What do you want to do? And, you know, there's probably more that went into it. Like like I said, obviously, earlier, you know, this team's a bit in shambles. You know, maybe we'll be a little bit optimistic and say not complete shambles just yet. But, you know, maybe he just didn't want to be a part of it. And, you know, that's the way she goes sometimes. So. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And, uh, you know, he asked us another question. He said, well, what we have heard right now and so far this offseason, will the overall chances we bring back in Cockway? I've said for a while, I don't think he's playing there in 2020. I haven't changed on that for any reason. So I'll go ahead and say 30% chance he's back. 10. Yeah. He's yeah, posted, right. he's posted, you know, I, and, and I seen your tweet, you know, saying, or it was either you or somebody else, but somebody said like, he posted a picture of Lawrence Taylor on his uh, Instagram story. And, you know, everybody from the Giants, you know, fa- Giants they Twitter. They do that. I will say, I've had people tweet that kind of stuff at me for like the last month. I follow him on Instagram just because I follow most Jaguars players just to get like, like Gardner Minshew posted a school picture about 20 minutes ago. And I posted that I follow them for those purposes. He has posted like legendary pass rushers on his Instagram for as long as he's been in the, in the NFL. So, I, I mean, I, I don't think that's worth reading into. I mean, if you're going by that, then, I mean, he posted Reggie White a month ago. I mean, maybe he wants to be a Packer. You know, I mean, he posted Derek Thomas. Does he want to play for the Chiefs? I mean, I, I, know, I just don't it, think that's worth looking into. This man's on social media so much to the point. You post these legendary pass rushers, but you're, I'm not convinced he's not trolling Jags fans though. I'm not, I'm, I feel like Lawrence Taylor, like, like doing Lawrence Taylor, like three days ago, he sees all these giants players, you know, fans in his mentions. Like, I just think it's funny. Cause I think, I think Yan's really directly like adding everybody and saying, Ooh, you want to get, you want to get tricky on social media. I'm the best at doing that. <laughs> you know? Well, that actually goes perfectly into our next question from happy tree hippie. When Unique goes to the Giants, what did the Jags get in return, he asked? Uh, uh, n- nothing. <laughs> they don't, they don't, absolutely they don't, nothing. Uh, maybe a comp pick uh, down the road. Uh, but, yeah, they, they, they get nothing. I, I don't see a tag and trade happening. I think he's either going to walk or they work out a deal. I don't think they tag him just because I don't think he'll play on a tag, and I don't think they want that distraction after a year full of distractions. All right, next question from Maybe Bobby. Why did the Jags wait so long to evaluate the staff? We missed out on so many good potential coach signings. I disagree because, I mean, a lot of coaching staffs are getting built as we speak. Uh, I mean, you know, Broncos fired their defense coordinator, two, I mean, offensive coordinator two days ago. So I, I, I don't think that's really an issue. I think Doug Marone really did want to step back, recharge for a few weeks, and evaluate things without knee-jerk reactions. Because I think if you evaluate things right after the season, maybe you still have a little bit of recency bias. So I think that's a big reason he waited two weeks. So I mean, I, I I don't really mind it. Yeah, I don't. I'm not. I'm not personally reading too much into that. I think um, you hit the nail on the head with that one. I think that you know, if if you're gonna evaluate your staff, like you gotta you gotta wait some time. Like they're not gonna do it the week of. They're not gonna do it the second the season ends. You know, if you're around, you're the head coach. You wanna you wanna take some time off. And like Doug Marone said in his press conference he's gonna have a couple of beers so you know he probably yeah. just wanted to sit back and he, have a couple he, of beers for a while. he deserves them at this point yeah yeah so okay and uh final question uh with what we've seen flip do with Minshew why did we let him go uh two things I don't think he was actually let go I think it was mutual and while Gardner had a solid rookie season the offense as a whole was very bad and I think that is not something you settle for just because you want continuity continuity for your rookie quarterback um, we talked about this earlier and, you know, we talked about Gardner Minshew making plays and 
you know, I said that too. I was like, you know, Flip looked like he had fun calling plays for Gardner, but you know, Gardner at the end of the day was out there making those plays. I mean, there were some throws he made, like specifically like the throw to Chris Conley in the Atlanta game, the deep bombs he connected to Keelan Cole with. Like you don't, you know, you don't coach that. Like that's – and obviously, you know, when he eludes pressure like in the Denver game, like you don't coach that. That's that's a player out there making plays. Yeah, so I think sure. a lot of Gardner Minshew's success falls on the shoulders of Gardner Minshew. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And like I said earlier, I think it's more important to have a good scheme in place than to be familiar with a bad scheme. So I, I, I don't think it's an issue. I, I, I think they're probably better off for it. I think both sides are better off for it. You know, I think Flip's better off. Just I think he's a better fit elsewhere, so – well, those are all the questions we had. Uh, Treve, you have any parting hot takes for us? Um, you know, I think this is the first time I, I don't have a – oh, okay, here's here's a hot take for you. I've seen this on Twitter. Um, and it, it was a real debate, man. There was, like, 12.1K, like, debates in this. Like, uh, crunchy Cheetos are way better than puff Cheetos, 100%. Not even close. Mm, no. No? no? No, not at all. No, no. Uh, cr- crunchy Cheetos are – Puffy Cheetos are Gordon Minshew and Crunchy are Nick Foles. Like they're, they're, they're not versatile. You got they're that tough. flip, boy. You got nope, that wave flip, nope, bro. No, nope. no. I'm, I'm ready to hand you your walking papers at this point. I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm Puff Cheetos at, at – you know, all, all hands on deck on that one. Uh, for my so, take – go ahead. Okay, I was going to say, so are you taking are you taking Puff Cheetos over Flamin' Hot Cheetos, though? I don't like flaming hot Cheetos. I, I right. see. I like spicy stuff. But I don't like flaming hot Cheetos. Same way I don't like 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 red hots and stuff. I don't know why. Like I'll eat I'll eat some hot buffalo wings or something. But I mean, if if you've seen me, I'll eat. <laughs> I mean, I'm 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 not eating uh you know red hot che- uh, the Cheetos or whatever. I just I've never liked them. I think they taste bad. All right, whatever you know. To avoid a twenty minute <laughs> debate, we'll just uh, we'll just avoid it. When, when, whenever you have a sophisticated palate like mine, uh, you'll, <laughs> you'll, you'll you'll come around. I'm I'm an aristocrat. What's like grow a couple of years, huh? Yeah, <laughs> you'll you'll learn one day, kid. Uh, <laughs> my parting hot take is the Chiefs will beat the Titans by twenty this weekend. If the Titans end up winning and going to the Super Bowl. I will take 100% blame for that. You can direct it all at me, but I think the Chiefs stomp them. Where do you where do you stand on that? Because, you know, this has kind of taken over Jags Twitter forever. Like, I think, ever since ten, Tennessee has been making this run, you're – obviously, you're, you're more you're more of a reporter on the, the side of things. Yeah. But, you know, what do you, what do you feel about Jags fans rooting for Tennessee? I don't, I don't feel anything about it. I mean, I – I, at this point, I, I really don't. I The only reaction I had to anything I saw like that was this weekend was how many people were mad at Calais Campbell for picking the Titans to win on a pregame yeah. show. Like, he can pick one of two teams, people. He's not like, he's not like <laughs> saying, all right, I'm going to go with the Titans. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to get a Titans tattoo of their raccoon or whatever mascot they have uh, across <laughs> the bear of my chest. He was picking the Titans to win a football game, and – he was right. So, I mean, I, I, that, so everybody that's, that's my only – that that was my only reaction to it. I did not understand at all why so many people were mad at Calais Campbell. I mean, I, I, I didn't get that at all. And, hey, Calais did a good job on that show. He, he has a media job in his future if he wants it. I'm telling you, too, I'm a big Ryan Tannehill guy, dude. I love my mediocre quarterbacks, and yeah. Ryan Tannehill's right that, up there. I will say that's the one thing about this Titans run. I love that they've done it with Derrick Henry. And Ryan Tannehill has completed 15 passes this postseason, and you still have <laughs> analytics Twitter. And I love analytics. I think making informed decisions with data, backing it up, is the way to go. But I think when you jump the shark is when it gets ridiculous. And when you're saying that the Titans are winning with a guy they've completed 15 passes with over two games instead of the guy that's literally been running over teams – I, I'm not getting what I'm not getting what you're putting down on that one. So I love that the Titans have just put so many brains, like basically, in the pretzels because they're doing it unconventionally. So that that's my takeaway from it. So I, I I I hope that he completes five passes this weekend just so I can see about how great of a performance it supposedly was. Well, well, you know, like I said, I just got a thing for mediocre quarterbacks. Ryan Tannehill's right up my alley for that. <laughs> that he is. That he is. <laughs> All right, well, uh, thank you guys again for listening, as always. Uh, you know, we'll obviously 
try to have these more frequently during the off season than these last few weeks. Uh, I, of course, want to apologize for that. But like I said, holidays between Christmas and New Year's and family obligations, plus even we need some time to recharge, just like I'm sure you guys needed time to recharge. So thank you, as always, for listening. And stick with us this off season. We got a lot of cool stuff planned yeah. ahead. Like I said, we're going to be at the Combine, at the at Senior Bowl, uh, East-West Shrine Bowl game. Uh, we're going to be live from TIAA Bank Field during the NFL draft. We're going to be covering free agency. We got you guys covered. So stick with Jaguar Maven. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter, at Jaguar Maven. You can follow me, at underscore John underscore Shipley. Uh, Treve, go ahead and give him uh, your Twitter. Uh, you can follow me on Treve Talks, at Treve Talks, and subscribe to the YouTube channel, at Treve Talks. There's going to be some content out there if you enjoy listening to me speak the spoken word. You can go over on Treve Talks where I have different kind of podcasts. Uh, we're going to be – we're actually going to be on – Okay, we're recording this on Tuesday. On Thursday, I'm actually going to have a podcast out where I sit down and talk to my mom. So that's going to be a good podcast. You guys are going to want to listen to that. <laughs> and, you know, uh, I, also want, I also want all of you guys to uh, at me on Twitter and send me thoughts and prayers because this snow is really coming down in Idaho. I know all y'all Florida people don't know what that's like, but the snow is real in Idaho and it's post-Christmas when snow is not supposed to happen. And my brother has a rear a rear wheel drive pickup truck, so we've been slipping all around the place. So thoughts and prayers for your boy during this tough time, and thank you guys for listening. Thank you guys again. Uh, we'll be back next time, but like I said, stick with Jaguar Maven, and we're going to have that good off-season content for you. Thank you again. Have a good night. Gang, gang.